You never get a second chance to make a first impression. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And that sounds incredibly unfair because sometimes we are not at our best and the impression that we're giving is received incorrectly. First impressions are incredibly important. People who study such things talk about how important it is and that most of us make decisions about someone or about a situation or form an opinion within seconds. People who study churches like ours and study this kind of environment where you have a morning corporate worship service and you have signage outside and and people and you come in and there's a coffee thing and there's whatever. What the people who study that say is that most new people, the vast majority and the 90% uh, number make the decision on whether they're going to come back to that church before the service starts. Isn't that incredible? This is how important first impressions are. People who study what I am doing right now, standing up with the task to talk to a room full of people for the next 30 to 35 minutes and try to talk in a way about something that's going to be important, that could be life-changing, that could impact our life. That what they tell us is that you will give me the first five minutes for free. <laughs> You'll give me the first five minutes free. If I haven't, if I haven't got you, if I haven't hooked you, if I haven't said something within the first five minutes, you're planning the rest of your day, your week, the vacation you want to take, you're replaying the 18 holes you played yesterday, whatever is going on, you will check out. So that first five minutes of any presentation is incredibly important. You might want to remember that at work. First impressions, that first five minutes, first five minutes of an interview. Guarantee people who interview probably have already made the decision after five minutes. It's important. Well, we're studying the book of Matthew, which means we're studying the life of Jesus. And we know that Jesus uh, shows up on the scene and, and he's, he's baptized and he, then he starts his ministry by disappearing for 40 days. That seems like a great way to start. I'm just going to disappear for 40 days, but that's what he does. And when he comes back, when he begins his ministry, we have this this part in Jesus, kind of his first impression begins. We'll be looking in chapter 4 of Matthew, starting with verse 12. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Now that's a whole other thing that we'll get to later on, okay? But when he heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and however you say that other place. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of that place, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light, and for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach. So here's what he starts with. Here's his first five minutes. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Notice it doesn't say that he just said this. It says that he began to preach. This repent, to preach repentance, is what he preached. He didn't just preach it one time. He preached it all the time. Repent, why? Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we're going to look at that this morning, but before we do, let's look at verses 12 through 16 because there's some things that we kind of need to understand there. Any you'll find in the class, if you'll come to the class for the next four Wednesday nights on how to read the Bible. By the way, we're going to record it. We're going to record the teaching and release it on Thursday. So if you miss a Wednesday night, you can watch it or you can go back and review what you've seen. But I really want to encourage you not to sit at home and watch it on the video. If you can be in the room, be in the room, please. By the way, I'll just say that while I'm saying it. For those watching you at home right now and you have no reason to be at home, you should be here. (laughs) For what it's worth. Repent. (laughs) (laughs) 
because the kingdom of heaven has come near. When Jesus comes back, do you want to watch it on TV? I don't think so. I'm just saying. All right. And I'm preaching to the choir. I understand. Because you're here. What was I saying? Oh, why, one of the things you'll find when you study the Bible, when you come across the things like these names, these names of these towns, any time in Scripture where there's a name of a town, you need to, why is that name? This is important. This is important to pay attention to. Well, it says that we know that, that John had been arrested. And like I said, we'll get to that later in Matthew. That comes back. He left Nazareth. Nazareth was what? This is his hometown. Okay, this is where he grew up. So, so there comes a time when you have to leave home. So he leaves home, and he went to live in Capernaum by the sea. So Jesus left the, he left Pahrump <laughs> and went to Vegas. I, I mean, this is what he did. He really did. He left, um, where, Matt, is Matt in the room? He, oh, he left Baker and went to Laguna Beach. This is what he did. Okay? So why does he do that? Well, part of the reason he does that is because it was prophesied that he would do that. But he didn't just do that because it was prophesied. It was prophesied because that's what he was going to do. Did y'all follow that? He doesn't do it to fulfill the prophecy. He did it because, I mean, the prophecy is there because that's what he was going to do. So why does he go to Galilee? There's some things that you need to understand about Galilee. And if you go to your Bible, if you've got your maps or look them up, you can see that area of Galilee it runs from the coast. It's in what is northern Israel. It's incredibly fertile. Uh, everything on the planet, if it can grow, it can grow there. It's an amazing place. And when he goes and leaves Nazareth and goes to Capernaum by the sea, he goes to an economic place. He goes to a place where there's life. He goes to a place where there's lots of people. That means there's an economy there. And there's, there's, there's reason to be there. It's populated. It's a beach town. It comes with everything that's related to a beach town and all of the things that go with that. I don't know. The closer you get to the beach, the more liberal things get. I don't know if you've noticed that. But it's true. It's very true. And so this is part of what's going on. This area was also known for, y'all don't let me forget to do communion, but I need to move this. It's not enough for me, but don't let me forget, okay? Don't let me forget to do communion. Okay, thank you. Um, the people in this area were incredibly open to new ideas. Very open to new ideas, which made them very open to leaders that would come and start a rebellion or an insurrection. This is just, this is the, the area in which it is. There is a part in, in John chapter 10, we talk about the thief comes to uh, uh, steal, kill, and destroy. And a lot of times we associate thief with Satan, Okay. In that passage of Scripture, and this is not a teaching on John, Ch John chapter 10, but just give you an idea. When Jesus says, steal, kill, and destroy, he's talking about three false messiahs that had risen at the time in the Galilee area that had gathered people to follow them. One group were vandals. All they did was they'd go in and destroy stuff. They'd go in and vandalize one group just went in and stole stuff, and the other group actually would go in and kill people. So when they hear, when Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, they're immediately thinking of these false prophets, these false messiahs. The area and the time in which Jesus was and where he's going is ripe for someone to rise up with an insurrection, to rise up and go against the flow. Now, you probably don't need me to tell you that Jesus went against the flow. Jesus did everything in the opposite direction. If everybody was going this way, he was going this way. If everybody was looking up, he was looking down. If everybody was looking down, he was looking up. I mean, he, he did everything that way. So when you read that, and we'll read verses 12 and 13, and we'll think, oh, okay, okay, just get to the point. Just get to, get, to the, get, to the, get, to the, get to the thing. Well, the thing there is important. 
to see what is going on. And so there's a reason. For so then he gets in and he says, he says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, if, we, if you flip back a page and you go to chapter 3 of Matthew, verse 2, or we'll just do verse 1. This is, this is John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Yes. I mean, the opening of Jesus is the thing that John the Baptist had been preaching and had been saying to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. So this obviously is important. If, if John the Baptist is starting with this, Jesus comes along, and he, now he's picking up the mantle of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist moves, moves out because he's not the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And so now it's Jesus. So now he's preaching this, and he's preaching this thing about repentance. Repentance. And if you're going to take notes this morning, I think it's very important that we understand there's two different kinds of repentance. One repentance, there is a repentance unto salvation, and then there is a repentance unto sanctification. And I'll explain what that means in case you don't understand that. A repentance unto salvation. Well, what is a repentance unto salvation? A repentance unto salvation was the person comes to the place where they say, I believe, I believe in Jesus the Messiah. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you've left heaven. I believe that you've come to live a perfect life. I believe that you went to the cross and died for my sins, took away the penalty of my sins, took away my old uh, sin, my old nature. You give me your resurrected life through the Holy Spirit, and you seat me in the heaven with the Father. And I, I, I repent of my sin. I repent of being in Adam. I repent of, of, of not being able to do good on my own. And I receive your gift of salvation. That is a prayer of repentance unto salvation. How many times does a person need to pray that? Once. You don't need to get saved 82 times. Okay? You need to get saved once. And once that happens, then the process of sanctification begins. And the process of sanctification, that's just a 25-cent word saying, now that I've entered into this relationship with God, my job is to take the next step with God. And to take the next step with God. And to take the next step with God to get closer and closer to what it means to live the life that Jesus has designed us to live. So there is a repentance unto salvation, and there's a repentance unto sanctification. And the sanctification is this process of becoming more and more like Jesus. How many times do you need to have a, how many times do you need to repent unto sanctification? Hourly. Okay, that's a constant repentance. So here Jesus is saying repent, and the word repent in and of itself simply means to change one's mind. If you've changed your mind about something, you repent it. And you're going one direction, and now you're going another. Another uh, good, I think it's a great definition for it, it's a change of attitude toward God that impacts one's actions and life choices. What is Repentance. It is a change in attitude towards God that impacts one's actions and life choices. That happens when you make a repent, you repent unto salvation. That happens. You're now, you don't belong to you. Now you belong to him. And now your way is to live his way. And then there is that process that happens with that. It's a change of attitude towards God that impacts one's actions and life choices. If you've repented unto salvation and nothing in your life has changed... If you've repented unto salvation and nothing in your life has changed, you have not repented. You've had an emotional experience. You got caught. You're trying to make something better. But you haven't repented. Because when you repent, things change. Now, one of the reasons I like this, this definition, that it's a change of attitude. It's June. We live in Las Vegas. 
and you're at church. Chances are you didn't kill anybody this week. Chances are. Most of our repentance needs to center on attitude, not behavior. Because most of us have kind of figured out the behavior thing. If you can keep a job more than two weeks, you've figured out the behavior thing. If you can stay married more than two hours, you've figured out the, the behavior thing. If you've learned how to drive a car, if you, I mean, oh, just think about all the things that are, that are necessary for you to function in life that you cannot function in life if you haven't figured out the behavior thing, correct? It's all over the place. Same thing happens in our, in our walk with God. Same thing happened when it comes uh, to Christianity. I grew up in a fundamental, independent fundamental Baptist church where it was hellfire and brimstone every week. And after about 15 years of that, I realized, you know what? If I don't drink or smoke or cuss, I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> Some of you are going, what? <laughs> I can't do those things? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there's more to it, right? There's more to just changing the behavior. There's some behaviors that we need to change, but most of our behaviors are attitude-driven. I want to say that again. Most of our behaviors are attitude-driven. You can do the right thing with the wrong attitude, and you know what you need to do? Repent. If you're doing the right thing with the wrong attitude, you need to repent. Because behavior isn't. God tells the children of Israel. Remember when we studied Jeremiah? Jeremiah, did, Jeremiah stood in the foray of the church and they made it all beautiful and they came in and they sang and they all sang and they, they did all of this stuff and they did everything great. And Jeremiah is standing in the foray going what? God has rejected you because you haven't given him your heart. You've given him your behavior, but you haven't given your heart. And God says the same thing to him. He says, I don't care about your songs. I don't care about your sacrifice. I don't care about your incense. I don't care about all of this stuff. You don't love me with your heart. So repentance, there's a repentance unto salvation, and there's a repentance unto sanctification. And in our repentance of sanctification that happens all the time, at the heart of that is our heart, which means it's an attitude. So here's some things. It's more than a feeling. You're taking notes. I, I so wanted to just break out in a little Boston right now, but I don't have the ability to do that. And I thought we would even play it over the loud, uh, out of the, but then they, they shut down us on YouTube. So just sing it the rest of your day. More than a feeling, Okay. Repentance is more than a feeling. Well, some things to it. One, there's a prayer of remorse. If you're going to repent, there needs to be a prayer of remorse. And a prayer of remorse is this. It's just you acknowledging that what you did was wrong or the attitude that you have is wrong. It's just saying it's wrong. And one of the hardest things for you to ever say in your life is I'm wrong. You can say I'm sorry easier than you can say I'm wrong. A lot of times when we tell somebody, I'm sorry, inside we're thinking, I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> Repentance starts with a prayer of remorse. It's wrong. And most people can't get past that. Most people in the world can't get back. Don't, what do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? What are you, what are you trying to tell me, Christian? What are you trying to tell me? You're trying to tell me I'm a bad person? Uh, yes. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. You need Jesus. Because left to your own, you might be able to do some good things. And you can behave really well. But you can't do a thing about your pending death problem. Admit it's wrong. And until you admit it wrong, admit it's wrong, whatever it is. And by the way, how do you know if something's wrong? 
Well, you might want to know how to study the Bible. Did y'all hear this Wednesday at 6 o'clock? We're going to do a four-week series on, and by the way, we're going to make it available on video so you have no excuses, on finding what God says is wrong and what God says is right. It's a prayer of remorse. And that is the first battle. Then there is a prayer of confession. And the prayer of confession is just simply, I did it. I did it. This is, this is admitting our behavior or our lack of behavior. Because sometimes the sin is a lack of behavior, not the behavior. It's a lack of behavior. It's just a prayer of confession. I did it. So there's a prayer of remorse that has to be first. Then there's a prayer of confession. Why does prayer of remorse have to be first? Well, if you don't know that it's wrong, if you don't accept that it's wrong, there's nothing to repent from. <laughs> okay, that just, that's, just, that's just logic. Okay, so prayer of remorse. Then there's a prayer of confession. And then there's the renouncing the sin. And renouncing the sin means stop it. That's what renouncing the sin means, stop it. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. How many times, Marty, how many times do I need to renounce the sin? I, every time, <laughs> that's exactly right. And I may have to do it thousands of times, but I have to renounce it. A quarterback's never ran off the field and said, that was a good interception. A linebacker's never ran off the field and said, man, I'm glad I missed that tackle. That's never happened. My bad. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try, try not to throw an interception next time. I'll try not to drop the ball next time. I'm going to try. A prayer of remorse, a prayer of confession, renouncing the sin. Those are the steps. And when Jesus comes on the scene and he's going to start preaching and he's going to make his first impression and everybody's now is going to listen to what's going on. This guy's got to say, who's this new rabbi in town? What's he got to say? This guy came in from Nazareth and now he's here. And what does Jesus start with? Repent. Repent. Because until you repent, nothing else matters. Until you repent, until I repent, nothing else matters. This is what Jesus started with. And remember, he just didn't say it once. This is what he preached over and over and over and over. Repent. Repent. Where am I wrong? What am I doing? What do I need to stop? Well, he says repent because the kingdom of God, he says repent. Let me find it. Repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. All right, the kingdom of heaven. Let's see, I got a solid 15 minutes to talk about the kingdom of heaven. All right, kingdom of heaven. What in the world is Jesus talking about? A lot of times when you hear the word heaven, it, matters, it doesn't matter what the phrase is, you immediately start thinking about heaven. And then if you've been a good Christian and you've gone to a good Christian church, they have taught you that heaven is filled with mansions, the streets of gold, and pearly gates, lots of singing, some clouds, lots of wings. It's a place where God is. You can see Jesus, Grandma, Grandpa. Right? Those are all wonderful things. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The kingdom of heaven is not simply heaven. There's far more to that because he said the kingdom of heaven is what? Near. Okay, so what is that about? Well, let's look at this whole idea of kingdom heaven. If, if repentance is more than a feeling, the kingdom of heaven is more than a place. It's more than a place. Is it a place? Yes. Are, the goal, are, the, are, are there streets in heaven? Probably, maybe, could be. You think they're paved with gold? Or do you think the writer was trying to say one of the most precious things on earth is what we use for asphalt in heaven? <laughs> Did we mention we're going to talk about how to study the Bible on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven. So what about this kingdom? Well, 
kingdom. We watch the movies. We like kingdom movies. I like, I like the more medieval the movie, the better I like it. I like swords and horses and armor and arrows and all of that kind of stuff. Kingdoms, you know, you got a king and he's got a kingdom and it's, it's just, it's, that's what it is about. We use the word kingdom. Uh, if you're into mafia stuff, if you're into, uh, you know, uh, Pablo Escobar, all of those kind of guys, what did they do? They set up their kingdoms, right? The kingdom of heaven. Well, the word kingdom is better translated reign, the reign of heaven, or the rule of heaven, or the authority of heaven. And heaven is probably in English better to say God. The reign of God, the rule of God, the authority of God, or the reign of Yahweh, the rule of Yahweh, the authority of Yahweh. And Jesus is saying the reign of God, the authority of God is near. Repent because his authority, his rule, his reign is there. And he says that it's near. So do y'all get that? So he's not saying heaven, the heaven that you have pictured in your head, that you probably got from movies more than you got from the Bible, just like the pictures you have of hell come from Dante more than they come from the Bible. Okay? That's not, he, this reign of God, the rule of God, the in other words, God has showed up. Doesn't that make sense? Is that what Jesus would say? Who is Jesus? He's God. <laughs> I mean, he's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. I mean, he showed up. It would make sense for him to say, hey, you better repent because God is in the room. God has showed up. His rule and his reign is there. But he says it's near. He doesn't say it's here. I know near and here rhyme, but he doesn't say the God, the kingdom of heaven is here. He says the kingdom of God is near. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, we know that Jesus has and or will fulfill everything. We know that. His reign, his rule, his authority is real. And he will rule what? Everything. He will reign what? Everything. His authority will be over everything. So now take into account, Jesus has showed up in Galilee. He showed up at Capernaum. He has showed up at a Jewish beach town. And he is a rabbi. He's coming in to teach. And he starts talking about the kingdom of heaven. It's the first thing out of his mouth. What did a Jewish person hear? They did not hear golden streets and pearly gates and mansions. You know what they heard? Rome is about to go down. Rome is about to be destroyed. Because God's kingdom, where did they get that? Did they get that because the, the Romans are really bad people? You know, they were kind of bad, but they also did a lot of really, really good things. You know, indoor plumbing, streets, protection, medicine. There's a lot of things the Roman Empire did. It got to be an empire because they were bad at everything. What would be in somewhat of mind? Now, we're gonna, I'm going to read from the book of Daniel. I know some of you are going to start hyperventilating. I cannot believe Pastor Marty's going to read from the book of Daniel. Don't get your hopes up. But there are some things. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. This is uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream. And so... Daniel is called in to interpret this dream. In verse 44, in the, in the days of those kings, and in the stream it has really four parts because it's four kingdoms. In the, in the days of those kings, the God of the heavens, Yahweh, will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and this kingdom will not be left to another people, it will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. Now that is God's kingdom. 
That is God's rule. That is God's reign. That is God's authority. It doesn't matter what kingdoms have been set up on the earth, whether it's the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Romans, it doesn't matter. What doesn't matter, that's going to be torn down. And what they believed, what a first century Jew would have believed when they heard this, what Jesus was talking about bringing about the kingdom of God, in order for that to happen, they already knew the other three had fallen. But Rome needed to fall. So now he's coming in to say Rome, Jesus is coming to, to take down Rome. Now remember, he's in Galilee, and what are the people of Galilee really good at? Insurrections. Like, we're going to go take stuff. Rah, rah, rah. This is what we're going to do, right? And so this is what he's coming in. Now, if we keep, if you turn over to, to Daniel chapter 7. Starting in verse 12. He's, he's talking about these beasts, these nations, these empires. Verse 12, for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extinction of life was, an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly, listen to this, one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and he was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one and will not be destroyed. This would fire a group of Jews up. To come in to say, this is what we're going to do. And this is, because this is their Bible. This is what they know. And they see Rome as this person. If we go down to verse 17, these huge beasts, four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Well, Marty, what in the world is the holy one? Who are the holy ones of the Most High? On Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to teach a four-part series on how to study the Bible. Okay? It's really one of two options. It's either angels or us. Okay? If, you, if you jump down to verse 21, as I was watching this horn waged war against the holy ones, Marty, what in the world is that about? Why is there a war against the holy ones? Why is God allowing there to be a war? I mean, why would he give these people an extension of time? What is going on? Those are great questions. <laughs> no, we're not going to answer that Wednesday night. Those are just great questions. Until the ancients of days arrived and a judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High, for the time had come, and the holy ones took possession of the kingdom. So why do I talk about all that? Is kingdom a place? Yes. Is kingdom an idea? Yes. Is kingdom authority? Yes. Is kingdom rule? Yes. Is kingdom reign? Yes. It's all of those things. Is a kingdom actually a kingdom like you would think a kingdom, like the bad guys are defeated and now the good guys are in control? Yes. Well, Marty, why is there the fight? Why does God allow the fight? I don't know. I don't know. But there is. What does Jesus say? Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is what? Near. Near. It's important. It's an important word. So I, I like to take really complex things and sim simplify them down. God will establish an eternal kingdom overthrowing all others. Fact. How? Don't know. When? Don't know. Is it going to happen? Yes. Will he win? Yes. There is a kingdom leader. And who is that kingdom leader? Jesus. Here's the third thing I know. There's lots and lots of mystery. If you cannot be okay with mystery, Christianity is not going to go well with you.
mystery. It's important. It's important to be one of the prayers you might need to pray. As Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, would you help me be okay with mystery? Because if you're going to have to have all your questions answered to be all in, you're never going to be all in. So you're going to have to be okay with mystery. So we had more than a feeling and we had more than a place. There's more than right now, but there is right now. There's more than right now, but there is right now. The kingdom of God is near, so the battle is real. And we need to know the battle. We know that we say it all the time. Things are not as they seem. I have an enemy, and I have a role to play. Things are not as they seem. I have an enemy, and I have a role to play. The, the, there's more than right now, but there is right now. So i got to understand that the battle is real. The battle that's real is one of the reasons we need to confess we need to repent unto sanctification because the battle is real because you don't win every battle. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed if you, if you could get to 50-50, you'd be feeling really good, wouldn't you? If you could get to 53%, oh, now you're winning. You're going to win more battles than you lose. This is why that's in there. Understand it's, it's more than right now, but it is right now. One day the reign of God will be unopposed. Right now the reign of God is opposed. I don't know why. Don't ask me afterwards. Don't send me an email. I won't be able to answer it. I cannot tell you. And neither can any of those other people writing the books about all the stuff that's going to happen that didn't happen, and now they've got to write another book. I mean, how many of those books are you going to buy? One day the reign of God will be unopposed, but that day is not today can start today but right now it's not today so one day the reign of God will be will be unopposed the kingdom of God his authority is near what did Jesus tell him to pray we'll get to it in a few weeks in the Lord's prayer to part of the sermon on the mount pray what thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is God's will in heaven fulfilled? Yes. In his, in his place of residency? Yes. And that's our job and our responsibility. He gave the first one, he gave the responsibility to Adam. Adam failed. And then he gave it to the nation of Israel. And Israel failed. And now who's he giving it to? Through Jesus, he's giving it to the church. How are we doing? Not so good. Matthew 13. Verse 11. When the, or verse 10. When the disciples came up and asked him, why are you speaking to them in parables? So Jesus taught and they didn't know what he was saying. They didn't know, understand what he was talking about. He answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. Do you see that? The secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, disciple of Jesus, because you have the Holy Spirit, but he hasn't been given to them. It's okay. Be okay with the mystery Please be okay with the mystery. Paul, at the end of the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is near, not here. Not in full and not unopposed. And then the third thing I would say about the more there is just to know the hope, the hope of, of I am making everything new. But look at this. I'm going to read from Daniel and Revelation in the same sermon. Revelation 21, chapter 5, and verse 5. Then the one seated on the throne, not the one seated on the thrones. So this is, this is Jesus, this is God, this is Yahweh. Then the one seated on the throne said, look. 
I am making everything new. I am making everything new. Continually making everything new. Listen. Don't make the kingdom of God a picture. Don't make the kingdom of God a painting. What do you know about a painting? It can be beautiful, it can be well done, it can be poorly done, but here's what you know about a painting. It's static. It doesn't move. You hang a painting in your, wall, in your hallway and you walk by it and you walk by it the next day, what's it look like? Just like it looked like the day before. And you, every time, it's static. The kingdom of God is not static. It's not a painting. It's a narrative. It's a story. It's living. It's changing. And we've got to make sure that we step in that. He makes things new. Does he make things new in the end when he becomes unopposed? Absolutely. Does he make things new now? Yes. I've given you a new heart. That's now. He restores relationships now. He restores marriages now. He pulls people out of depression now. He gives people hope now. And just wait. Wait, yes, knowing that one day it's going to be unopposed, but do the now. He makes all things new. So there is a yet and a not yet. There's the kingdom of God that he's going to set up. And there's the kingdom of God that is here right now. So what should our focus be as followers of Jesus on June the 2nd, 2024? What should our focus be as followers of Jesus on June the 2nd, 2024? One, let me tell you what it's not. It's not being consumed about when Jesus is coming back. And the reason that is, is because Jesus said, when I come back, it's going to be like a thief in the night. Nobody's going to expect it. And he also says, nobody knows. So let it go. That is not what we're supposed to be about. Not when is Jesus coming back. Just know he is. And when he is, I want to recognize him. And when he is, I want him to recognize me. So that's what my focus is on. Here's something else what we should be doing. Not try to solve all the mysteries of the scripture. But solve the mysteries God wants us to solve. Which means on Wednesday night at 6 (laughs) o'clock. Because he gives us a lot of answers, by the way. Lots and lots of answers here. So what should we be doing? Repenting. Repenting. You know why a lot of people are consumed with the book of Revelation and Daniel? Because they have no interest in repenting. They have no interest in living the way of Jesus. Repent. How do we repent? Call wrong, wrong. Be remorseful about it. Acknowledge when we do it and stop it.